All the gardens are covered by rose leaves. All the mountains have put on their holy dress. A thousand years ago, the poet Fadosi sang the praises of Ing among Persia's mountains. Today, the people of Iran still look to their mountains for water, precious water for the high arid plain on which most of the people live. But too often, rivers disappear in the great central deserts of Iran. East and west lie other Muslim lands. Iran knew greatness in the days when it was known as Persia. From this throne room in the capital, Persepolis, King Darius ruled over the first great empire in history. This carving shows Darius seated on his throne, receiving tribute from the people he ruled. Syrians bring golden bowls, bracelets shaped like horseshoes, and small horses from what is today Arabia. There were Medes. There were Syrians from what is today southwest Russia. There were sheep from Turkey. There were vessels with exotic shapes, full of precious liquids. There were humpback cattle from what is today India. All these were a part of the Persian Empire in the days of its greatest glory. There was a chariot like those of the pharaohs. Even Egypt was ruled by this Persian king. And there was a Bactrian camel from what is today Afghanistan. On this golden tablet, Darius inscribed, I am Darius, king of kings. The great god Ahura Mazda has given me the rulership of all races. This is my kingdom. Here in gold was outlined the empire which was handed on to Xerxes, his son. Xerxes, at the head of vast armies, extended Persian rule to the limits of the known world. The Persian armies were defeated by the Greeks, who pursued them back to Persepolis. Through this gateway, Alexander the Great strode in triumph. Conquerors of a different kind came a thousand years later, when in from the Arabian Peninsula swept men with flaming sword and a new faith. As this new faith of Islam grew and mellowed, the followers of the Prophet Muhammad built great churches called mosques. The masjid e shah the royal blue mosque of Isfahan, was completed in the 17th century by Shah Abbas. He ruled during Persia's second golden age. Polo was developed in Esfahan and played in the great square while the Shah watched from this porch over the palace gateway. From his palace, Shah Abbas ruled a reborn expanding Persia. He built roads, irrigation systems, and great bridges like this one, but even his empire finally crumbled. Centuries later, in 1925, Reza Shah rose to power and a new era began. Under Reza Shah's son, needed land reforms are changing old patterns and bringing hope to the people. The Shah's palace is typical of the architecture of modern Tehran. Former rulers lived in the Gulistan, or Rose Garden Palace. In its mirror throne room is the fabulous peacock throne. This golden seat of state was designed so that its occupant sat cross-legged, with his back against a bolster encrusted with pearls and rubies in gold settings. Tehran, the capital of Iran, is a modern city with roots in the past. The great Muslim religious college of Sepa Salah is one of the intellectual centers of the Islamic world. These young men are studying to become mullahs, religious leaders. A woman wearing the enveloping shadur reminds us of the strong links with Eastern tradition. New buildings are among the visible signs of progress in Tehran. At their national university, young Iranians are learning to become the doctors, teachers, engineers, 
and religious leaders of the future. Esfahan is the center of the ancient craft of Iran, as it was in the days of the Shah Abbas. In the bazaars, the ancient crafts like copper smithing continue little change. Modern machinery has come to Iran, but has not taken the place of the skilled craftsmen. The hands of Esfahan craftsmen turn with special skill to the creation of fine articles of silver. The skill of these craftsmen artists is not easily acquired. For 50 years, these hands have guided tiny chisels, none over the tenth of the size of a finger. This small case is ornamented with figures of legendary heroes hunting lions in a scene from the Persia of long ago. The shop windows of Esfahan display other traditional arts. These miniature paintings illustrate themes which have changed little from the time of the Shah Abbas. The painters sit all day, seeming scarcely to move a muscle. His brush, three camel hairs. And this is some of the work he does. The best known product of Esfahan is the Persian rug. Even a small rug is made up of thousands of tiny knots, each one of which must be tied by hand. The knots make the woolen tufts or pile of the rug. The warp or foundation consists of cotton threads wound between large rollers. After a few rows of knots have been tied, they are pounded tightly together with this comb-faced hammer. Children's tiny hands tie the smallest knots of the most delicate designs. As modern industry, like this textile mill, comes to Esfahan, mill owners and workers alike face the problems of adjustment to the machine age. Shiraz is the capital of the province of Fars from which Persia took its name. The monumental city gates and the palace of the Kashkai suggest the beauty of Shiraz, whose history is full of the names of astronomers, philosophers and poets. The climate is agreeable here. Oranges grow near reflecting pools in which Muslim poets saw the tranquility they sought in their faith. With this monument, Shiraz honors its most beloved son, the poet Sadi who lived 700 years ago. Saadi's poetry is still the basis of the living Persian language of today. The people of Shiraz are among the most progressive in Iran. They have introduced modern methods of agriculture. They have built a fine new technical school where young men are being taught the use of machine tools. In their medical school, Young people are being trained to fill the serious shortage of doctors. Some of the students are women. But medical care has not yet reached much of rural Iran. About 90% of the people live in villages like Kenare. Kenare exists because it has water, water drawn by this primitive hoist. Three centuries ago, Elaborate irrigation systems supplied a land feeding twice its present population. Today, this well can supply only about eight gallons of water a minute. The village people come here to wash their clothes, and in this same water, they wash their dishes. Sheep and goats drink at the same source from which the people draw their water for drinking and cooking. This girl carries on her head the quart of water she has walked half a mile to get. Kenare is cold and dusty in winter, hot, even dustier, and much more uncomfortable in summer because of the flies. At home, the girl's mother makes bread from wheat flour that was the family's share of the crop. 
the landlord owns the field and also the house in which the family lives. Germs breed easily here. They are spread by dust, flies and unclean drinking water. The main food is bread. Only occasionally are there vegetables and a little goat's milk, and meat is scarce. Their bedding is the most precious thing they own. They have a copper samovar, a broken lantern, a teapot, a few cups and saucers, a mirror, and a picture of the Shah. These things are all that this hard-working family owns. The house has two rooms, a sleeping room upstairs and a cooking room downstairs. This is the only stairway. Mother is baking bread this morning. Although Iran is rich in oil, oil products are too expensive for this family. Mother walked 15 miles to gather twigs for her fire. As father walks to work, he realizes that he is neither much better nor much worse off than most of his neighbors. And as he works in the fields with the landlord's oxen, he knows that little has changed in Canada in 25 centuries. There is still the old system of land ownership. The fields are ploughed in the same way as they've been for centuries. But there is now a steel tip on the wooden plough, a reminder that change is coming as the great natural resources of the country are developed. The most important resource is oil. At Abadan is one of the world's largest refineries. The refinery was developed by British interests and built to serve customers of many nations. Iranian technicians are developing skills to operate complex machinery. High industrial wages have attracted men from all over the country. Men from the Highland tribes, men from the city bazaars have put on the workman's helmet. This then is the new man, a man who looks with hope from when, with the future development of her industry, Iran may know again some of the glory it knew when Darius ruled at Persepolis. Over the mightiest empire, the world carving shows Darius, seated on his throne, receiving tribute from the people he ruled. Syrians bring golden bowls, bracelets shaped like horseshoes, and small horses from what is today Arabia. There were Medes. There were Scythians from what is today southwest Russia. There were sheep from Turkey. There were vessels with exotic shapes full of precious liquids. There were humpback cattle from what is today India. All these were a part of the Persian Empire in the days of its greatest glory. There was a chariot like those of the pharaohs. Even Egypt was ruled by this Persian king. And there was a Bactrian camel from what is today Afghanistan. On this golden tablet, Darius inscribed, I am Darius, king of kings, the great god. All the gardens are covered by rose leaves. All the mountains have put on their holy dress. A thousand years ago, the poet Fadozi sang the praises of king among Persia's mountains. Today, the people of Iran still look to their mountains for water, precious water, for the high arid plain on which most of the people live. But too often, rivers disappear in the great central deserts of Iran. East and west lie other Muslim lands. Iran knew greatness in the days when it was known as Persia. From this throne room in the capital, Persepolis, King Darius ruled over the first great empire in history. This Kadahura Mazda has given me the rulership of all races. This is my kingdom. Here in gold was outlined the empire which was handed on to Xerxes, his son. 
Xerxes, at the head of vast armies, extended Persian rule to the limits of the known world. The Persian armies were defeated by the Greeks, who pursued them back to Persepolis. Through this gateway, Alexander the Great strode in triumph. Conquerors of a 